We're talking on this programme about the meaning of life and we've got to the point in our discussion where we are talking about the origin of our free wills and why the supreme being behind the universe gave us free wills in the first place. Because it is incredible that you are still able, despite all the deterministic forces that work upon you through society and through your own heredity and environment, it is incredible that you still have free will. I mean, you can still turn this off. Now, don't turn it off, but you can still turn the knob and get rid of my uh, miserable old voice here. And you can still turn your car to the left or the right. You can stamp on the brakes. You can do what you want. There is a real sense in which whatever state you are in, you still have free will. And we've been talking about the origin and the reason for that free will. And you remember we've been sharing how the creator of the universe revealed to his son Jesus of Nazareth and to early servants like that man Moses that he made us because he wanted us to be his friends. That's why you exist. Uh, that's the real purpose of your life, so that you might get to know the originator of the universe and might come to know him personally. That's it. That's it. I mean, you may think, oh, you're here to make money or you're here to survive or you're here to fix pipes or you're here to teach kids. No, you're here to get to know the one that made you because he actually wants you to be his friend. Uh, I know that sounds bewildering and amazing and incredible, but actually that's the truth. That's why he made you. And that's why he made you like himself. You're actually in his image. That's why we're all so alike because we all have the same capacities as he has. And yet you remember we said that he did not make us like himself inside, because that would be to make us incapable of love. If he made us unavoidably good, and that is so that we couldn't do anything but be good and do anything but love him, then he'd have a bunch of robots and performing monkeys, but he wouldn't have free will agents who could love him. And so he made us with the same capacities as he has, which was really necessary so that we would be friends and so we could have deep interaction with each other. But then he let us choose whether we would get to know him and would become like him or whether we would live independent of him and become unlike him. And that was up to us what we did. It would have consequences later on because really he's the only one that exists at the end of this world. But uh, yet he gave us that freedom. And you remember we said that he pictured it to mankind in his childhood away in the early centuries as the choice between two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we've shared how the tree of life symbolizes, among other things, the kind of oneness that comes between you and another person when you've been living with them for a long time. And we've shared, you remember, how two friends tend to become more like each other. They tend to take on each other's characteristics simply because they're with each other and they love each other and they're attracted to each other and they admire each other. So often the son becomes like his father because he respects him and admires him. So it is with us and the creator of the universe. His plan was that we would begin to develop the world and to fill it according to his directions. That is, that we would begin to do what he guided us to do through the thoughts that he injected into our minds, thoughts that we wanted to receive from him, not thoughts that he forced upon us, but thoughts that we received from him because we wanted to know what he's thinking. And you know, if I ask you, uh, would your uh, wife like to see Les Miserables? You could answer me, yes, she would or she wouldn't, because you know her. You know the kinds of things she likes and the kinds of things she doesn't like. If I asked you, would your wife really like to go to the next computer exhibition, you could immediately answer yes or no, because you know each other, you understand each other, you know the kind of things the other person is thinking. Indeed, you know it would be true that I could ask you all kinds of finer, more sensitive uh, uh, questions that would make greater discriminations and finer distinction than that, and you could still answer me, correctly, because you have got to know her. Now, that's what we mean when we talk about eating of the tree of life. The maker of the universe 
planned that you would come into this world as a little baby, would come up maybe to that age of discretion, and as you'd come up from five through seven through 13, you'd uh, begin to realize, well, of course, I was made by the Creator, and He is my Father, and He loves me, and you'd begin to talk to Him, not uh, as a, some kind of uh, psychotic or neurotic, but just as an ordinary human being that knew that He hadn't got here by chance plus time, and concluded that He had come here by the action of an intelligent being that was as personable as he himself was, and you began to think thoughts up to that being. You didn't even need to talk to him aloud because he isn't physical, but you could think thoughts up to him, and he, as a result, would pass thoughts back down to you from his own mind and would indicate to you, as he obviously indicated to people like Einstein. Now, there's a theory of relativity here that will explain a lot of things that at the moment are inexplicable, and bit by bit I lead somebody to go on beyond that theory, but if you listen to me, I'll give you hints of what it is. And actually, the truth is that all our poets, all our creative people know that the things that they create, they don't really create. They come to them. It's amazing. Uh, all of us are in the position of Einstein and uh, of other creative people who say all ideas come from outside ourselves. We suddenly waken up and they're there. And actually ordinary people like ourselves have some of that experience. So that's what we mean when we talk about the tree of life. The maker of the universe wanted us to develop the world as a result of our friendship with him and the ideas and thoughts that he was giving us. Uh, that was the way to do it, of course, because he knows what is at the bottom of every mine. He knows what is at the center of every mountain. He knows the power in every river. He knows all about the protons and the neutrons. He knows the dangers of a Chernobyl, and so he would have guided us so that we would avoid those things. Of course, you know we didn't do that. Uh, you remember the story of the fall, it's called. The fall in the Garden of Eden, uh, the fall of mankind out of that relationship of closeness with the Creator, that occurred because, in fact, man chose to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, if you want to know, well, what is that tree of knowledge of good and evil? It isn't about apples. Let's stop that silliness. Anyway, apple isn't mentioned in Genesis, and the creator of the universe isn't a kid, you know. He isn't some dum-dum that uh, kind of kills us because we eat an apple. It isn't about apples, and it isn't about sex, you know. We all love, oh, it's sexy, sexy, because we had to wear clothes. No, it's not. It's not that stupid stuff. We need to stop in insulting the maker of the universe and insulting all the guys that wrote the Bible by saying that kind of stuff. No, it isn't. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's dead easy. Instead of listening to God the way he intended us to, you remember I gave the example, it's just a silly little example, but the Creator's plan was he would tell Adam. Adam would say, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do today? And he would say, well, it's morning. You need something fresh. Look at that orange tree. See, get an orange and squeeze it, and you'll get some nice juice, and it'll clear your palate. So Adam would do that. That's the way the Creator wanted us to operate, in close closeness to himself. Now, instead of that, Adam decided, forget this. I don't need to depend on this creator, this invisible being that feeds me ideas. I can see that this world is all that I need. All I have to do is note down the things he told me last time. I remember yesterday he told me to get orange from the orange tree. Okay, that's a law of life. I must get orange from the orange tree. I remember last spring he told me to dam up that river. All right, that's a law of nature. I'd better dam up that river. And we began to develop our own knowledge of good and evil. A whole set of precedents, business precedents, economic precedents, academic precedents, psychological precedents or precedents. Uh, we call them in England, I think. But we, we began to develop a whole series of laws that would enable us to develop the world on our own independently of the maker's directions. And that's part of what eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. It's living this life by our own cleverness and by our own observations of what in the world will give us what we need. Now let's talk a little more about some of the effects of that tomorrow.